<laughs> or knew where we were yesterday, these folks have gone through a rather torturous arrival. Yesterday, uh, they were supposed to fly from Salt Lake City early in the morning to Chicago to Pittsburgh. And I'm driving from Washington to my night class last night, and Chuck calls me and says, the flight's been canceled. They're somewhere between Pitts uh, Chicago and Pittsburgh, and we don't know what's going to happen. So good old Chuck ch drives uh, down with his dad and picks up these gentlemen and brings them down and save the day. Then they lost their luggage. Okay. So we've been running late doing everything, and believe me, we're trying. So I'm, I'm going to make my comments brief. Uh, my name is Reg Laser. I know a lot of people here. Uh, and those of you who know me and know our program here in the Special edu Education Department know that for years California, Pennsylvania, uh, California University of Pennsylvania has been preaching something called a non-categorical approach. So it's ironic, it's ironic that we're here tonight as part of Mental Retardation Awareness Month. And it's the Mental Health Mental Retardation Program along with Fayette Resources and CEC that has sponsored this event. But you see, I'm going to ask a question, audience participation. You ready? How many people here would like to get rid of the label mental retardation? I want to hear greater enthusiasm than that. Come on. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're going to have a very enjoyable evening because we've got two of the most wonderful people that we could possibly bring. Am I losing this? Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me back there? This guy is unbelievable. <laughs> And I don't know which one I'm pointing to because they both are absolutely incredible people. Uh, as some of you may have read the book and some of the articles we've circulated, Kim Peek uh, was supposed to be called mentally retarded when he was very young. And what you're going to find out is that, ladies and gentlemen, we are blessed this evening to have a genius with us. He has got incredible knowledge, absolutely incredible knowledge. Listen carefully, because the moment something is said, a question is given, pay attention. You will see some subtle reactions. You will see rapid thinking. You will see a gentleman who is processing information so quickly and then gives it back to us in such a beautiful fashion. Kim and his dad have, have traveled all over the world <laughs> talking to people and, and if you heard their schedule what they went through yesterday was absolutely nothing. But Fran, Fran Peek and I, uh, uh, Kim's dad, I said to him yesterday, I said, you know, this guy, this guy Kim, he must keep you very young and very busy because he's always coming up with these wonderful in, in intuitive remarks and uh, uh, tonight at dinner I said uh, I said uh, well no Kim said something about I'm gonna follow my dad until he wears out <laughs> <laughs> and I looked and I said how many miles does he have left there do you think uh, I think they have a lot of miles left, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up now and just say, please listen carefully. Don't hesitate to ask questions. Please respect both of these gentlemen. They've done such a marvelous job in helping the world become more aware of people with differences. So here is Fran Peek and Kim Peek. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Regis. Uh, I've only known Regis for about 24 hours, but I feel like I've known him all my life. Not all his life, but all my life. A remarkable person. Yeah, next month we're coming back. We're going to, to
to be with the Ark of Westmoreland. We, the Ark's been a big thing in our life, and Kim was born in 1952, 51, and he, he may correct me lots of times, he always does. And uh, I went to work for an advertising agency, and I uh, concerned about trying to find uh, some kind of help for Kim. Nobody knew what was wrong with him. They just said he's different, got a big head. At nine months, they said to us, uh, uh, the neurologist who looked at him, he says, uh, uh, I've only got five minutes to talk to you and your wife about your boy. But he says, I've looked over his medical records and I have to apologize, but I'm late for a golf game. And I know that sounds very, very uh, bad that I'm being this way, but he says, I missed my golf game last week and it cost me a hundred dollar fine and I can't afford that. He says, so I want to tell you, I can tell you anyway, in just a few words, your son is severely mentally retarded, he'll never be able to learn, he'll never be able to walk, put him in the institution and forget about him. And I said, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't have anything to say to you, uh, go, 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 enjoy your golf game. And I took my wife out and we said to each other, uh, doesn't look very bright, does it, and uh, what do we do? And so I decided that about that time I was going to do my darndest to find out what we could do and were there other kids like him and what about what the parents do when they get hit with something like this or she was only 23 and uh, uh, so uh, I went to work for an advertising agency. I just graduated from college. I had a degree in, uh, in commercial art and uh, bachelor of Fine Arts degree in Commercial Art and Communications and I also had a minor in Banking and Finance and so I thought well the bank had helped me go to school and the GI Bill had I'd been in World War II I was in B-29s and I was assigned fortunately uh, two squadrons behind the B-29s that bombed Hiroshima so I didn't have to go there and I never had to drop a bomb on anybody but as I went along I wish I had brought some of the bombs back with me because I met a few doctors and social workers that I'd like to have left one with. <laughs> but anyway, I, I decided to get as, just as involved as I could and then I find out my boss has a daughter five years younger, five years older than Kim, who is severely retarded. And she was now about six years old. And I thought, uh, I says, what do you do with your daughter? And he says, she, she's home. And I says, and what does she do? And he says, she stays home. He says, she only goes out of the house when she has to go to the doctor. I says, who stays with her? And he says, I've moved my mother-in-law into my house. So she has a 24-hour babysitter. And I thought, how can you do this? Uh, I'd never met her and I didn't even know about her until he told me that. He says, how come you talk about Kim? Aren't you embarrassed to have a child born with male retardation? I says, I don't know. I don't even know what it is. I don't know. Nobody can tell me what's the matter with him. Except what that doctor told us and we wouldn't believe him. We took him home and we, we loved him. His head was a third larger than normal. Really big. And his neck muscles couldn't hold it up and it fell onto his chest. And back in the 1950s they didn't have restraints to hold it up and stuff like that. We had to put him on the sofa and for three years at least he had to have pillows on it around his head so his head wouldn't fall down and get too damage to his spine. And we had to hold him gently and we loved to do that because at 16 and a half months he started to read children's books. We couldn't understand the noises he made when he was reading, but we could only read the book to him once. And, and they were golden books that Dr. Seuss hadn't, uh, hadn't done all of his thing yet. He had Cat in the Hat come out when he was about 17 months old and he did read that, uh, but uh, we couldn't understand him. And I, I see as we talk to parent groups, they have trouble with kids that have autism and different kinds of disabilities and they can't speak. They make noises, they say, but they can't speak. And I said, well, that's what happened to him. It wasn't until he was three years old we started to figure out why, how he was talking. He talked in syllables. He would read three or four words together and maybe have one syllable or two syllables and three or four words. He didn't know what the words meant. He just knew what the letters looked like and sounded like. So he would, he would, it was just really funny to uh, all of a sudden when he was three years of age, we had him down on the 
floor after breakfast and, and when he sat down he puts his head down on the floor like a snow plow. If he's going to crawl the, the, the forehead moves like a snow plow and he follows it. He said to us, what does the word confidential mean? And um, my wife says, where did you find that? And he says, you haven't read the paper this morning. It's right here in the paper. And there it was in the headlines. And his mom says, why don't you go look it up in the dictionary, which was across the carpet in the corner of the living room. Puts a snowplow down and he moved across the carpet and about 30 seconds later says, I found it. And I said, looked at my wife and said, he found confidential? She says, I don't know, let's go look. So he walked across the room and he had his finger on the word confidential. And uh, I said, uh, how does he know the alphabet? To look up a word in a dictionary. And Kim, I says, how does he know alphabetical order is the way I said it. And he didn't know what alphabetical order meant, but he knew what alphabet meant. And I said, Kim, do you know the alphabet? He says, I do. And I says, can you tell it to me? He says, you want it frontwards or backwards? I says, how about frontwards first? And so ABCD said it really fast. And I said, can you tell it to me backwards? He said, I have to sound it to you backwards. And so he sounded it to me in the phonetic syllables he read backwards. And he, he did that this afternoon for them. He actually sounded backwards for people. But a lot of times when kids ask him in schools about the alphabet, he'll, he'll give it to them backwards and then tell them to figure out what he said because they should learn it frontwards. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> then we looked down at the words and as he read them to us, we all of a sudden realized that he was reading in these kinds of syllables. And this happened, and he kept doing that until he was just about four, and then all of a sudden he started to understand what words started to mean because when he was four years old, he was strong enough to crawl over to the bottom shelf of the bookcase in the living room and pull out the books of knowledge, which were pretty big encyclopedia books. He memorized the first eight volumes, which were the indexes. Now, no matter what word he found any place, he knew where to find it in the dictionaries. Almost every time, not in the dictionary, in the, in the uh, books of knowledge. And you could ask him, uh, when were automobiles made? And he would say, uh, volume one, page 262, continued on volume page four, 425, continued on volume five, page 762, and he'd take you through those things because he'd memorize the indexes. Still didn't know what most of the words meant because that was going to come along as he started to read. And uh, by the time he was six, he'd read about 250 books. And we thought, well, you know, any kid can read 250 books. So that, especially when you don't know what you're reading. And then we found out that he could give us every one of them back word for word and he started to know what they meant. When he was really little, about two and three, when I couldn't read him a book second time, I would say, why don't you want me to read it to you? And he says, you've read it. And I says, how do you know that? And he'd say, turn to page 14. I turn to page 14. He gives me page 14 verbatim. And he says, page 14. And so I go back to page 4. He gives me page 4 verbatim. And then I go back to page 11. He gives me page 11 verbatim. And, all, and my wife and his says, what he's done is he's memorized every one of these pages. And if you mixed them all up, he's, he wouldn't know what the story meant. And he doesn't know what the story means anyway. He just knows what all the words sound like and look like, and he knows what they look like afterwards, but didn't know what they meant. That was his early two, three, and four, and then all of a sudden everything made sense to him, and he started to read lots of things. I think he was probably about eight when he started to read Shakespeare and memorize it, and he didn't know what it meant until he was about 25 when he got to go see a Shakespeare play, and they better not make a mistake and when the actors, because he, one night we were watching King Lear, the guy had two paragraphs to go, we'd been there about two hours, two paragraphs to go, and he started on the last paragraph before the next to last paragraph, and Kim, in his loud voice, says, Dad, Dad, stop it, stop it. And they, they turned on the lights and said, do you need a paramedic up there? And I said, I don't know what the problem is. And I said, Kim, what's the matter? And he says, 
that guy down there in the costume sitting on the fence, he knows what the matter is. And I said, you know what the matter is? And, and I said to everybody when they handed me the microphone, I said, first of all, I need to apologize for waking you up. <laughs> and then that, that got him laughing a little bit, thank heavens. And then uh, Kim says, he knows what the problem is. And they, they, they took a mic to, to the actor and he says, I'm really sorry. He says, you know, he says, uh, I had started to give the, the paragraph and I realized I was on the last one, but he says, they're so much alike, it wouldn't matter which one I really ended on. Kim says, it would matter to William Shakespeare and it should matter to you. And uh, people started to laugh. Anyway, the audience started to be with us and then they said, the, the guy in charge of the Shakespeare Festival there, he came out and he says, we all know Kim and he says, uh, and we did it wrong. So Kim, what we're gonna do, we're gonna go back for paragraphs and start from there, would that be all right? And Kim says, we'll try it. And so they turned the lights off and they finished it. And then we were crowded after we, people came over and patted him on the back. And a lot of them were hissed at him too, but it didn't, didn't matter. I didn't take him any more plays. We go down, we're invited down all the time. We just meet the people on the greeneries and stuff before the plays and don't go to them like I don't take him to symphonies either because if there's anybody in the orchestra that comes in at the wrong time and so many things, he'll tell them right from the audience. <laughs> we were in St. Louis one night. We were guests of the board of, uh, of the opera and they said we're going over to hear Slash, what's his name, Kim? Yeah, he was the composer. Now, now he the, he was the uh, guy, and now he's in, in charge of the JFK thing in Washington. And Kim says, "I, <clears throat> I'll go over and see him one of these times when I want to look over the side and watch Watergate." <laughs> He knows all about Watergate too. And Dustin Hoffman played with in, with Robert Redford in the, in the movie All the President's Men. Kim met Jed McGruger after he'd been in jail in uh, in uh, Lexington, Kentucky. He was a he was a priest in a Presbyterian church after he got out of jail. And, we were back there speaking and the, the, the guy who was a banker took us to early to the services to, to meet him. And he, he comes out, we're sitting in this pew and it was about 15 minutes before church started. And, and he comes out, Magruder, in these big robes and he walks over and he leans over the pew and, and the banker says, uh, Jeb, I want you to meet Kim, he's the rain man. And Kim looks at him and says, uh, don't worry Jeb, I'm not Dustin Hoffman today. <laughs> and Magruder just pulled right back and left. We never get, get to talk to him. But I don't think he was a deep throat because Kim already knew who that was and had already told him a few weeks before. So it was frightening, but I think he knows who he is because the guy turned ash and white and left the room. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Kim's head and then we want to get into racking his brain. Yours and my brain. We have a left brain and a right brain. It's connected with a band-aid looking thing that's called a corpus callosum. Down in the back of your head you have a ping pong ball shaped cerebellum which is the main part of your brain. And all of your system senses, your hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, go into the cerebellum from your senses. The cerebellum sends the information up the brain stem into the corpus callosum which allows the left and right hemisphere to talk about everything your brain is bombarded with. And the corpus callosum is part of the mechanism that helps to, to filter out about half of the information that it's heard because it's heard it before, or it doesn't think it needs you, transfers it to different parts of your memory. And down, a lot of it goes back down to the brain stem into the cerebellum and it's passed out into your motor system and also into your intellectual system. And that's kind of how fast your brain works and how it works. Kim's brain, no left brain, no right brain. He has one brain. He has no corpus callosum. He has what's called the ACC, which is the agenesis or the absence of the corpus callosum. So he has no filtering system. Everything that goes into Kim's cerebellum, which is also damaged on the lower right bottom from a blister he had when he was three years of age, it, it, it went back into the head after uh, we found it and we took x-rays of it and it went disappeared and, and because x-rays couldn't show you tissue, they just only show you hard stuff, we didn't ever know what happened to it. It wasn't until he was 30 
37 years old. The, the same month the Rain Man premiered in December 1988, the University of Utah Medical School and the uh, Channel 5 decided to do a documentary about Kim, and part of it included a 360 MRI picture of his brain. That was a whole bunch of pictures. They just lined the walls of the MRI place up and down. They were about three high and, and ran for just seemed like miles. But they found some interesting things. First of all, the single brain. They found out that that blister had been pulled back into this end of the cerebellum for some reason with so much force, it actually exploded about a two inch chunk of the cerebellum, knocked out his ability to reason. It knocked out his physical coordination in many parts of his body. He can't kick a ball and he can't dribble a ball, but he knows everybody who could ever kick a ball and who could ever fast one or who could dribble one. He can tell you all about them, but he can't do them himself. Except on May the 12th, he's been invited to Chicago to throw the first pitch out for the Chicago White Sox in their new Freedom Award night. And he's going to go back then in July 30th, he's going to get a Freedom Award. And I didn't know what they were until I found out Helen Keller got one, so we decided it might be nice to have one of those. <laughs> and uh, anyway, and he couldn't go to school because he was disruptive, mentally retarded too. Like, like we just said, that uh, they were all labeled then, and, and uh, they're still labeled. And I, I guess they have to be described some way, but I don't know how you label them. I went through the arcs thing about ten years ago when he had to change the name from the Association for Retarded Citizens to the ARC and it was rough. The parents didn't want to have mental retardation. We didn't either. But what we kept saying, what do you, how do you tell what they are? Uh, and so now, Kim, we, we, they couldn't even call him autistic. He's known as a, a member of the Savant Syndrome. And uh, they called him a mega savant because he has 15 subject areas that he knows everything about. An autistic savant has one, two, three, maybe four. You've seen the autistic savants that play, them, play the piano after they've heard the music once. They can play it back. Kim can't play the piano, but he can sing you back over 85% of classical music and operas because he heard them between ages three and six on phono photographs. and. Uh, and, and you ask him some of those things, you won't believe what, what he knows. And, and the, the Germany's been over with their camera crews, and Japan's been here, and Sydney, Australia came over, and, and uh, Johannesburg, Africa's been over. We don't go over there because it takes too long. We can only go for five to six days, and I have to get him home because I have to shower him and shave him and, and do everything you have to do to a little tiny kid, Put even put the toothpaste on the toothbrush, even though it's electric toothbrush. I have to help him brush his teeth or else he'd wear his tooth off because he doesn't move the darn thing. Uh, and he has to have his food prepared, but he eats pretty well. He's got good eating habits. And as he does these things and improves on the things that have to make him somewhat normal, I think he won't become more independent because he doesn't want to be threatened with security problems. He likes being comfortable and he likes telling me what to do and I do it. <laughs> and I, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of what I've, I've tried to help him do, and, and I'm certainly proud of, of him. And uh, I w would do anything to help him, and I would like to make him be independent, but I, I just about given up trying to help. Uh, I don't know how to change him. I've had third parties come in; they, they, they can't uh, handle it too much longer. But he's just not going to become independent completely. Uh, we have assisted living centers. He goes out and talks to them, and they want to know, can he stay with us, you know, and all that kind of stuff. He doesn't want to do that either. He wants to be with people. Talk to 2,250,000 people in 15 years. And uh, we've never, when, when Dustin Hoffman came up to me after he studied Kim in Hollywood, he says, you know, uh, he's too complicated to be Rain Man. And he says, I'm going to have to study a couple of other savants, one that can do mathematics and reason. He says, because he just, uh, it's too hard to do. And uh, he says, I, I'm uh, basing, well, uh, the, pro the original script was based on him and all about him, and if they'd made it the way it was originally done, it would have been a documentary about Kim. And we didn't know what he was then. We didn't know he was, well, he never, was really 
called autistic, but that was the syndrome at the time. That was big, and they, they wanted to, to create an awareness of autism because it was becoming all really heavy, especially in the West Coast area. And so uh, Dustin, uh, Dustin studied Kim, and after he studied him, he had a lot of his film friends there, and he came over to us in the Rain Man studio down in Hollywood, and he said, you know, I can't believe this afternoon. He said, nobody knows all these things he tell, he's been telling me about. He says, uh, uh, I'm going to study a couple of other guys if that's okay. And that's, that's fine. He said, we're going to make some script changes too, but we'll talk to you about it later on. And, and uh, he, he did talk to me later about it on, and he under, told me what they were going to have to do because they wanted it to be a powerful movie and not a documentary. And I'm a person who says you don't send anybody to an institution unless there's nothing left to do. It can only be a medical place that they can't serve in the community. And they said, well, we're going to start with your funeral because we can't do that. And if we're going to put him in the institution, people can relate to that and they know what that's all about. That happened. And then they, I, I told them, please don't put him back in it at the end of the movie. They said we're going to do it because that'll create more awareness and maybe we can get people to, to, to move to community programs for people with disabilities. And thank goodness you have every state in the union now is basically community oriented. You, you know the group homes and the individual apartments and all the things that are happening, the workshops out in the, in the communities and the, the on-job things that happen with other people. That's what it's all about, and that's what it's going to continue to be. And although Kim isn't part of the community workshop anymore, for 12 years he kept a payroll for 158 workers that worked on peace contracts. Three sixteenths of a cent, seven eighths of a cent, one tenth of a cent, and he ca he get their worksheets from their supervisors, and in three and a half hours every other Wednesday he did all 158 paychecks. And uh, because he memorized the 11 contracts, so he didn't have to figure them out. He never used an adding machine or a calculator. He just saw 71 pieces of 3 sixteenths, and he knew what the answer would be, and put them down, and he could carry the totals in his head, and then subtotals and all that stuff, and never made a mistake. And then in 19, 1991, the state of Utah had sent out a memo that says, if you use state or federal funds in any of your programs, you have to have your payrolls and your accounts payables done through the state computer. Kim, who was doing this in three and a half hours every other Wednesday for a dollar twenty-nine an hour, was fired. His job was taken out. They didn't fire him. They kept him in a workshop. They just moved him into into a, a learning how to shred personnel documents. And when we asked him how he learned to do that, when he can't not coordinated to do that kind of stuff. He says, I read the instructions. Wasn't too hard to learn. And besides that, I watched Oliver North a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he became a, a shredder. But uh, they had to replace him with two $500 a week bookkeepers to do what he was doing for $1.29 for three and a half hours every other Wednesday. And that was too bad because that, that didn't make me feel too good about bureaus in the government. And he talks to them all the time now. They, they call us in to talk about diversity and disabilities and they have to have these programs now twice a year in every agency in the federal government. And we speak to, we speak to about seven or eight a year in Arizona. We were up in Washington, D.C. in October talking to 22 of them. And we were in the Ronald Reagan Auditorium on Pennsylvania Avenue, about three blocks down from the White House, and it held about 250 people, and they had reserved about 75 or 80 seats on the right side for the upper echelon of the 22 agency people. Most of them here, they come in with their dark suits on and their white ties, white shirts and ties, and big security badges, and they filled up that side of the room. They introduced Kim, he was the keynote speaker. He took the microphone and he looks over there and he says, you know, Dad and I haven't seen so many ushers without flashlights in our whole life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when he was six years old, we had a doctor, Peter Lindstrom, neurosurgeon from California, came to Utah and he, they took us up to the health department, my wife and I, and they said, we have a parent option for you. We said, what's that? And he says, 
They said, we think if we give Kim a lobotomy and put him into the institution, you'll be better off. And we said, a lobotomy, how, how can you do that? And he says, we're doing it all over the country. We're removing a lot of the people from institutions into mental health buildings because they're, they're cheaper. And uh, I said, what, what, you, you know he knows how to add, subtract, multiply, divide. He can read, he can write cursive, he can print. He's read about 600 books. Uh, you want to talk to him? And he says, no, we, we're not going to talk to him. And I said, you're not going to touch him either. And, uh, and uh, so now Peter Lindstrom happened to marry, be married at the time to Ingrid Bergman. And so when anybody ever in the audience talks to Kim about Beethoven, the, uh, what was the name of the movie? Immortal Beloved. Immortal Beloved, the life of Beethoven. The main character in it was Isabel Rossellini, who happened to be the illegitimate daughter of Ingrid Bergman. She was married to Peter Lindstrom at the time she had, had uh, Isabel. And then... Uh, uh, Tom Cruise's girlfriend from Rain Man was the other co-star in in, uh, in the story about Beethoven, so that was big and important to Kim. Beethoven's big and important to Kim too, because he knows all about Beethoven's life and all of his music, and he sing that to you if you want him to. And so uh, Kim says, you know, and he can't say this in a church or an elementary school, and he's promised me he won't, although he does sometimes. He says, you can't call Isabel Rossellini that name you give girls that aren't illegitimate because she's a wonderful lady and she didn't ask to be born. You, we respect her for who she is. He says, and you can't call her mother a bad name either because she was making a movie and probably didn't know what was going on. He says, but the one you call the, the first book of the John Jakes Bicentennial series is Peter Lindstrom. And he says, but I can't say that in a church or elementary school. Anybody know what the first book was? Yeah, he knows, the bastard. <laughs> anyway, he didn't get a lobotomy. In Utah, when, when I was president of the ARC in 1954, the state ARC, we had 4,700 people in the institution. About the end of this year, or it was in November, they have 121 in the in the institution and they're all in medical places you don't even know they're human beings really but that's an American fork. We tore down two of the buildings, four of the buildings are still up and they've been remodeled to train people to work in social services in the community to help people with disabilities and seniors who have disabilities not just people who are growing up, people who are growing down. Masters, masters. But I, I want to let him talk to you now, and I want you to ask us personal questions, as well as uh, questions to him. Uh, they've got a microphone up here that you can come up to if you'd like to and, and ask questions. Uh, I know adults usually won't do that, but uh, is there a, a, isn't a portable mic up there? There was one here, not here, but someplace earlier. Uh, so we got to hear your questions really loud so that everybody will know what Kim's answering. But we'll, what we're going to do, we're going to ask this guy right here I've been staring at. When's your birthday? April the 17th, 1938. Easter boy. You're an Easter boy. <laughs> and this year, and you're 66 years old on... And you're 66 years old on a Saturday. Okay, now what year has his birthday been on Easter? 38, 49, 60. It won't be that way again until 2022. Wow, how about that? <laughs> okay, now, now when, he was, when he was 20, who won the World Series? It was the Yankees beat the Braves in seven. Thank you. And who were the pitchers? There was Spawn, Burdett, Pizarro, who was it? Who was Ford, it? Ford, Turley, uh, Ford, Turley, Duran, all those folks. And when he was 30, who won the Super Bowl? It was Green Bay 33, Oakland 14. He always from the Pittsburgh area. Have you always lived in the Pittsburgh area? Yes. Okay, any of you who hasn't lived in the Pittsburgh area or around Pennsylvania, have you ever lived in another city 
any place in the country or out of the country, tell him the name of the city, but don't tell him where it is. Where have you lived? Anchorage? Anchorage. What highway goes to Anchorage? There's the Glen and the Richardson merge and the road to the shore mer and the shore road merge. What's his area code? Is 907. What's his zip code? 995. Does he have any TV stations up there? It is, there, there is Anchorage, Fairbanks, Juno, Sitka, Inuvik, in, in, Inuit, Prince George, Prince Rupert, and, and Whitehorse. Uh, who does he pay his phone bill to? It is, it used to be called, there, there is a Verizon, and it's also called PTI all, all, all tell systems. Thank you. And uh, when was <laughs> when, when did Alaska come onto the flag? In 19 Jan January 3rd, 1959. And what day of the week was that? Saturday. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else have a, a here? City. Here's one over here. Where's it? Arcada. Arcada. Eight two two is eight three nine, Humboldt County, Eureka. Where is he? On the coast of Redwood, Redwood Country. Oh, you're in California. Yeah. Okay, what road goes to his house? That's one o one goes along the coast, and it's called the Redwood Highway. It's also called the. There is Eureka. Arcata, it's called Humboldt County, thank you. And what uh, is his area code? It's 707. How about his zip code? 955. Plus two other numbers. And, and, and your 37679 and 23. You know that? They're your TV seven station. 7 uh, and 24. You know that the, the, the areas you are are Eureka Redding. Is Eureka Redding. When did California become a state? 1850 and the hum, it's called, what number was it? 31st, it's called the Humboldt, it's called the Humboldt Redwoods, the, the, the Humboldt Redwoods, the tallest tree, the oldest tree, the Redwood Park, all of that's in that area. Beautiful, isn't it? Mm. Beautiful park. If you haven't been there, get there because it's something else. Get there be I know you like you like the Beatles to come back here, but get there before the Beatles get to the Sequoias. That's that's the bad part. Okay. Any questions on, on history or music or the Bible? Uh, doesn't care what religion you are, if you want to buy talk to the Bible, if you're Jewish, then he'll talk to you and relate the Old Testament to the Quran. We're going to be with a Jewish group tomorrow. Are we? Tomorrow, late tomorrow afternoon, we're going to be with a Jewish group, and that's. Last May, you talked to two Jewish summer camps, uh, 800 kids in one and 1,100 in the other in north of Atlanta, and we're not Jewish, but we just had a wonderful time. Does he understand the foreign languages? No. No, he's no. a good man. It's hard to find him. He, and he was in Paducah, Kentucky about 10 years ago and somebody, we were in a library of a school talking to a small group of gifted children and one of them says, do you understand uh, foreign languages? And he says, over in your library you've got a Reader's Digest condensed book, special edition. What year did it come out? 1957. 1957. And I said, well, well what's so different about it? And he says, it's printed in French. And I says, uh, do you know, uh, do you know what, the, what the books in there were? What did you tell them? A thing of beauty, stop over Tokyo, the FBI story of the spiral road. I said, do you want, I like to read them to the kids and then you can learn French. And he says, why do I want to read it? I've got the copy in English and they all start on the same pages. <laughs> He's, if you've got Reader's Digest books, it's fun to take him to all the hotels we stay at because they usually have about 10 of them someplace. And he'll go up and you can just read him a name and he'll tell you all about the book. Been, I've been thinking about 
recognizing differences. And okay, I want you to tell them your message. What's your message? Learning to recognize and respect differences in others and treating them as much as they want them to treat you will make this a better world to live in and you don't have to be handicapped to be different. Everybody's different. Everybody's different. Everybody's different. You know, you know. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, he was asked to talk about 160 juveniles in the detention center south of Salt Lake, and we went in and talked to them. And uh, uh, he said, uh, "You know," he says, "When were you born?" And the kid would tell him his birthday. He says, "You're born on a Thursday, and this year it's a Friday." And you know, if you'd get your act together and try to be a decent citizen, first of all, you have to learn how to respect yourself, and, and a lot of you got a lot of work to do there. But if you learn how to respect yourself and respect the law and love your mom and dad half as, as much as they love you, you might be able to retire in 2052 on a Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> And we had two judges, juvenile judges in the audience with us, a lot of parole officers, and now he's scheduled for four juvenile justice conferences in Utah before the end of the year. And, the, and the, the, one of the justices says, you know, if we could have him at our sentencing, he could teach those kids more in one sentence than we can teach them in 20 years. And, and it was amazing because after it was over, almost every one of those kids lined up and came by and shook our hand and says, thanks for helping us and that's so it was neat people trust him because he's so innocent and he's so smart and unless he's so tired he's getting awfully tired but he's very very uh, warm with everybody I have to tell you one thing and I told this a couple of times but children especially kids with problems are really close to him and his heart when we were back in uh, Pittsburgh uh, two years ago, uh, the uh, year that um, Fred Rogers died, KWQED. -E <laughs> anyway, they, they had him come on on the six o'clock in the morning news lives because he was going to be talking at a couple of places. And uh, uh, they, they talked to him, and he wasn't on the news until about quarter to seven. But the, a lot of the people on the staff talked to him, and they were just kind of surprised all the things he knew, especially about Pittsburgh. And, and so they said, we're going to have him on live for about three minutes, but what we'd like to do is know if we could have you from about 9.30 till 11, 11.30. We want to take him around Pittsburgh and film him with some camera crews because he can tell us all about all these statues we have around here. We know they're there, but we don't know who they are and all this stuff. So they took him to the Carnegie Library and all around, and then he took him back to the studio, and here was Mr. Rogers. He sat down and he told Mr. Rogers his life, everything he'd done to help all of public television grow and what he'd done for children and for parents. And then at the end, he stood up and they said, we only got about another minute. And Kim stood Fred, uh, Fred Rogers up, put his hands on his shoulders and says, you know, Mr. Rogers, he says, you have a piece of the heart of every child in America stuck in your heart. And then uh, he started crying, they cut the cameras, but then three months later he passed away. But uh, I know maybe some of you have seen that, that program that comes, they put it on every once in a while, it's uh, called Close Up or something like that. Um, American Cancer Society two years ago asked him if he would be one of the headmasters at their cancer survival rallies. And we went up about 90 miles north of Salt Lake to a high school. Went out on the track and the whole grass part of the track had 200, 250 people there. Parents and relatives and lots of cancer people. He saw a young girl about 22, 23. Uh, she had a little girl standing by her who was dressed in a white dress. She looked like uh, two or three half gallon milk cartons put together because that's how big she was. She wasn't quite uh, two and a half feet tall and she was almost three years old and she had a shaved head. And she had a little, a little banner across her chest that said cancer survivor. And Kim went over to the mother and he says, is this your little girl? And she says, yes, it is, Kim. And he said, would you let me talk to her? And she says, that would be nice. So he kneeled down on the ground and he reached over and he took the back of her head and he kissed her on the forehead really hard. And he says, my little lady, you have done so much for God. 
And the mom says, what did he say? And I repeated what he said. And she started to cry, and I started to cry. And Kim stood up, and he picks the little girl up, and he hands her to the mother, and he says, hold her close to your heart, because the ground's damp. <laughs> so he brought us back to reality almost as fast as he took us away from it. <laughs> But he, he, he loves little children. And uh, I remember when we were in, where was that place in, in, was it Charlotte when they took you up? Yes. Charlotte, North Carolina. The TV people wanted to get some pictures of him going through a, a child care center for children with disabilities. They sat him down in his chair and they brought in this beautiful little three-year-old girl. She'd been in an automobile accident when she was about one and a half and lost the left side of her brain. And she had the longest, most beautiful brunette hair and she looked like a little angel. And they sat her on his lap and he put her down on the floor and she put her up again. He says, I'll be right back. And he walked behind these great big boxes that were made into blocks. And he brings out this little tiny kid who was bent over. He looked like a miniature hunchback of Notre Dame. And he was hard to look at because he was so distorted. And Kim brought him over, sticks him up on his lap. And he says, would you mind taking pictures of this little guy? He's not pretty like a little girl, is, but people have to know he's around because he's a very important person. And they saw, of course, they took pictures of him, and as soon as that made Kim happy, then they put him away and brought the little girl out again. But it was just amazing. Kim had seen him back there playing in these blocks, and, and they told us that's, uh, that's what he does. He heads right for the blocks and gets behind him so that other people won't look at him and laugh at him. Okay, let's get some more questions for you, huh? Okay. Kim, do you do remote viewing? I do. I do what? I do think about what did you say? Yeah, what did you say? I couldn't quite understand what you meant. Do you do remote viewing? Can you remote view? I can. Can you share anything with me? The most interesting thing you've ever been able to view? What? I can come up to her. What, 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 do you, what do you want to tell her? That I can even follow, pe follow people like you do. Guide you? I can do that? Yes. Yes, I know that a lot too. It's not nice. And I guess he's awkward with what, what you talked to him. I just didn't quite understand it. Huh? Later we can talk to him. Okay. You're welcome. Raise your hand and ask him something about history. Want to know who all the monarchs of England have been since Britain became a country? He can tell you when they were born. You know, it was, it was interesting when they were making this documentary about him in 1988, the reporter came to his room and she, uh, she was looking at his books on the British Empire and uh, he, he knows he knows more about uh, Winston Churchill than Winston did. He just followed him all through his life, and he, all of the monarchs. And she'd been going over things. She pulled out this book, and she says, Edward VIII, what was different about Edward VIII? He says he fell in love with Wally Simpson, who was a divorcee. He, he loved her more than he loved the crown, so he abdicated. And she says, that's right. You know what ever happened to Edward's mother? He says, yeah, they've got her anchored off of Long Beach. <laughs> I saw sort anything of like that you look at her, <laughs> but but you really have the, almost the same features yeah, as her. She has the same colored hair. You just don't have a gold tooth like our Mary Ruth with a gold tooth. Mary Ruth is 83 years old. She's in an Alzheimer's unit. Been in there about been in there about uh, two months now, hasn't she? Kim? Doesn't know who we are anymore, but she recognizes us. We see her every day. We're in Salt Lake for about four hours. It's kind of sad, but she remembers everything about 10 years ago back, but not now. Got a question? Oh, yell it to me. Did you hear what she said? What'd she say, Kim? 
I don't know which ones did, but I know there's several did, but no. I got a got a live mic. We keep walking between, and can't do that. We'll have to stay over on this side. Look, we can't, uh, Kim. I don't think he knows that, and he will, he won't make anything up. If he doesn't know it, he says I don't. Yes. What's the meaning of St. Patrick's Day? When the Irish wear the green. <laughs> hey, Kim, come here. Kim, you have to stay by this mic. I won't stay by any you mic. You have to hold it because it's just too hard to hear it if you don't talk into it. Now, where did it originate from? In Ireland, and that's why they have all the green. Thank well, you. Who's, who's Patrick? He was the founder of the... He Christianized the people of Ireland, the Irish people. And when was this? About... 430 or 450 AD. Oh, okay. Thank you, folks. Okay, let's get another question. Here's one. Yeah. What, what group do you feel was responsible for John Kennedy's death? It was the, the, the there were, there were Russians and three Cubans and uh, Russian defected, and, and there were Russian defectors and that stuff in the time, and and we had the 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 handling of affairs in Cuba was so was too hard on some of the people who had them. Thank you. And, and what happened when JFK was shot? That's what happened. Oswald had been married a Russian lady, and there was two. And, and, and so, so, so the Cuban episodes are, had a really hard effect. Had a really hard effect on what, on on policies, just like 9/11 does today. Okay, and who shot who shot uh, Ruby? Uh, uh, Oswald shot Ruby. Ruby. Ruby shot Oswald. And who, who, what happened to Ruby? He, he, he died of cancer in a in a me, in a in a me, in a medical ward. Well. Well, while while awaiting a review, well, awaiting. And can you tell us the details on when Kennedy was shot? He was, he, he was shot about 12:30 p.m. in Dallas, and he died at 1 p.m. Thank you, November 22nd, 1963. Okay. And, and, and for all of us, I just think that the not that this impact of what Bush and his people have done about this. Iraq, I think it's starting to really have an impact on the on the on the forces that we have there. The the Spanish want to pull out. We we have some bad feelings about Americans around the world, don't we? Yes. Do you think we can straighten that out? Yes, we can. What do you think about uh, President Bush using uh, the images of the 911 tragedy as his campaign? I think about Giuliani came on. When was it? it? Was about a couple of Sundays mm -hmm. ago. Well, a couple of Sundays ago, wasn't it, Dad? And he said that's kind of what that's kind of what changed America. And it so happened that Bush happened to be president at the time, and I guess any president probably would have done the same thing then. And I guess as long as, uh, I guess as long as the people who lost a lot of friends there feel bad about it, I, I think that uh, the Bush administration will probably curtail them or change them. But I, I don't think it, I don't think it uh, promotes him. I think it makes us all think about how what a tragic time that was, and maybe it'll renew our patriotism in America, not in a president, but in an America, and maybe that's good. So it's got good and bad things about it. We just need to get our country back behind our country, and I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat, be an American first, okay? Yeah. Yes. Did you hear what she said? She's way back. I know she's way back, but I couldn't hear what she said. So that's why she's way back.
would he? Does he have hobbies? His hobbies, hobbies are reading mostly. He probably reads uh, five to six hours a day, and uh, the rest of the time is traveling to and from the library and to and from the assisted living center. We spend most of our Salt Lake time doing that. So we get out to schools in the mornings frequently, uh, schools and all the other things, huh? Oh yeah, he reads uh, he reads a newspaper, just one newspaper a day, and he reads a Smithsonian once a month. He reads Newsweek once a week, Time, U.S. News, uh, Discover, uh, TV Guide every Monday. He memorizes it and checks to see if any stations have changed their call letters or their their affiliates. Uh, keeps updated on all that stuff. When he goes to the library, he updates himself on all the area code changes. They come out every two weeks to the library. Yes? Yeah, I think what Regis would say, if you're going to ask questions, would you mind coming down to that microphone? Huh? Oh, they're trying to set up a cordless that we could pass to you. That would be just great. Okay. Okay, here she comes. Here comes the electrician. cordless. If you played for the Hall of Famer, Played from played f with with the Cardinals, Giants, Braves, Cubs, and Browns, 1915-1937. Hold, still holds the record for the highest batting average in a season. And what was it? Four two four. Okay. Kim, over here. Kim, did you ever attend any public schools or any type of schooling? He had, a, he had home teachers. Uh, we went to the school district and told them we had five kids that were mentally retarded at the time. They were, and we, they weren't allowed to go to school, so we said maybe we could allow the schools to come to our houses. And they said, well, we can't do that. And we said, well, I think you better. And so the five of parents, we went over to the school district along with a retired teacher who came in as our leader and uh, she convinced them that they ought to hire part-time teachers and let them come 45 minutes every Tuesday and Thursday during the school year. Kim started at age 7, 14, he'd finished high school curriculum. When he was rain man, then the state of Utah legislature called a special session and brought the school board up there to give him his diploma because they wouldn't give him the, the diploma because he was handicapped. Now he has a couple of doctoral degrees, honorary ones, you know. Yeah. Can he tell us his flight itinerary from Utah to here? Yeah. <laughs> what what we, did we do? We went from Salt Lake to Chicago to Pittsburgh. We were supposed to go to Latrobe, but they canceled our flight. But but they'd already had the luggage here yeah, by they, the time we got. Yeah, to yeah they put it on. The, they put it on the flight before they canceled ours. Another one. Okay, now tell her how you're going to go home Friday. From he Latrobe here, Latrobe, Pittsburgh, San Francisco, back to Salt Lake. Yeah, by going to San Francisco, we miss a four-hour layover in Chicago O'Hare. Kim Scott calls it Chicago Slow Hair. <laughs> <laughs> yes. How many years? of Jesus' life were left out of the Bible, and what is it that is suspected that he did with those years? There are very little things about the Da Vinci Code. Yeah, the Da Vinci Code's got to bring up a lot of things, but you know, the, the one of the big things that's come up is the painting of the, of the Last Supper. Now, when was Da Vinci alive? Yeah, 1452 to 1590, when was Jesus alive? In the early part of the Christianity, Christianity can, cannot guess it. Yeah. 
They didn't have a very good Polaroid picture of him eating dinner with all those people, did he? No. There are a lot of problems the Bible. The, the Bible, if you've got faith, that's what you got to have. Because it's not fact, well, but it's faith. I want to know what he read. I'm sure he's read Well, he's read the same things you have, and, read, and most of them are, are stories. <laughs> well, yeah, he's memorized it. He's memorized the Bible, and he's memorized all the Mormon books. He's memorized the Jewish books, he memorized Buddhist books. He, he also knows that uh, there, they seem to be what happened, but there are storytellers that wrote them, and, and we didn't really have people who could write things until, uh, oh, about 300 B.C., you know, that's when they first started to get your scholars, and that was before Christ was born. And Mel Gibson, I, I haven't seen his passion thing, but I'm sure that he's done kind of a uh, kind of a, a Hollywood type of thing of maybe Christ to get attention to. We don't know how much of it's true. We know that a guy who is called Jesus Christ lived in the area of the Middle East about when they said he did. We guess, but we don't have any verification he was even ever there. But we, we hope so, and I think the religion is a, is a significant important thing to a person's life, but you've got to have faith. You've got to believe that what's, what's hoped for. Maybe it isn't there, but it's hoped for. And that's the way he is too, except he says he's a child of God, so it must mean he thinks something bad. In fact, he said to me about three years ago, he says, Dad, do you know why and when man created God? Because he got tired of being made a slave by kings and queens. He wanted somebody he could understand, so he made God. And if you think about a person literally, who speaks literally and thinks that he's saying that, you have to think about it. But if you've got faith, and you have to have faith in your friends and your neighbors, and if they believe in, in God, that's their business, but you have to believe in them because they're, they're people. And that's the way I feel about it. I don't know if there's a God. I, I, I hope there is because it's, it's very important to think there's an afterlife. Some people have to have that. I also have to know what's going on in everything else. I have to know how a, how a nucleus in a cell is the same as the sun in a solar system and the same as the solar system is in the universe. And I have to know what makes that happen. I want to know why DNAs and, and chromosomes make, uh, make change in, in all living things. And you want to call it Darwin stuff? I don't know. I think it's been going on forever, but I think religion is a part of being a human being. And I think that's very necessary. Whatever you want to believe is your business, and I wouldn't ever take you on, because if you want to believe that, that's your right. If I want to believe what I do, that's my right. But I certainly wouldn't show disrespect to any of you if you want to try to convert me to whatever you believe. You can, you can con try to convert me all you want. You maybe won't do it, but I'd be certainly willing to listen to you. Yes? Would you or Kim change anything about the way your life has gone? Yeah, I'd like him to be more normal. I'd like to be more independent so that when I'm gone, I th I'd like him to be able to take care of himself a little bit more than he'll be able to. But that, I don't think I'd change too much more. We've tried to share him, and we've tried to do it without advertising him as a freak or anything like that. And uh, we, we've tried to support programs to make other people have better lives, parents have better lives. Um, it's a... Uh, feel good that we've done quite a bit to help people like that. I know that we, we have a book and we sell it periodically. We didn't bring a lot with us here. But uh, we sell it and, and $1.92 is our commission. It goes directly to Kim's workshop, which he's on leave from, which he probably never will go back to, but he's been gone now since 1991. And uh, that $1.92 for seven years has provided a Christmas banquet, dinner, and a dance for 365 handicapped kids that go in the community programs in Utah, and, I, and it's going to got enough in there for three more anyway. So uh, we feel that that uh, w wouldn't change that at all. Yeah. Yes. Uh, can you sing Phantom of the Opera? Phantom of the Opera, Kim. Can you sing any of that? Oh, 
Uh, you belong to my heart's on the other side of the record that he has Phantom of the Opera on. <laughs> When Kim was three to six, he heard about 85% of classical doing, music. He knows all that. What I was doing was... David. Yes, sir. <laughs> Your cousin David had that, did Yes, sir. How many times does he have to read something before he memorizes it? Oops. How many times does he what? How many times does he have to read something before he memorizes oh, it? Oh, just once. I, I didn't tell you about how he reads. Uh, you know, a page that you and I would read in three minutes, and two hours later we'd remember about half of it. He reads it in eight to ten seconds, and he never forgets what it is. At UCLA, the, the, the uh, psychology department had him down there uh, doing some eye testing. They found out that when he read a paperback book, and they had eye cameras on him, his eyes didn't focus over on the page. They found out that his left eye reads the left page and his right eye reads the right page because the pages, centers of the pages are equal to about where his eyes are. They gave him a test of eight pages in a paperback book. He read them in 53 seconds. And 20, uh, two hours later, they gave him a comp test. He had a 98.7% recall of the pages in, them, in order and uh, verbatim and with the numbers at the end of each thing was part of the verbatim stuff. I asked if I could take the same test. We've never had anyone look at his eyes like that. And uh, in fact, some, some doctors have said it might be because he only has a single brain area here. Maybe he has a, a double optical system to compensate for it. We you know, don't know what going to happen when the brain starts moving around and all the human cells change. And so uh, um, I asked, took the same test. He read it in 53 seconds. I asked dyslexia. He reads upside down, backwards, sideways, all over. Yeah, we have to throw them away once in a while, don't we? Yes. He helps do that. He picks them up, puts them in, in boxes so I can transfer them out to the garbage. Yes, Kim? he reads the newspaper, does he like to read the comics or the crossword puzzles? Nothing? Doesn't read the comics. The comics he watches watches uh, public television, the British comedy. You see watches you know stuff. I do that? Yeah, you match the LDS leadership with the people on the British comedies. <laughs> and you give them the same name as the people on the comedies have. Yeah. And he calls them matches and then he calls his mother and tells her which match is going to be the spiritual speaker on channel 11 BYU's TV for the day. But he's respected by almost all of the leaders of the Mormon church. He's not a Mormon. He's not a member of any church. He's a child of God, isn't that right? Cuthbert. That's how it all started. That's right. If Kim reads this, could he read this back to us after he reads it? Can he memorize it? Could, could he read this now? And then tell us after. I can ask him too, but I don't think he will. Okay. Would you, would you like to read this little, the Lenten cross? You want to read it out loud, and then I'll take it away from you. See if you know what it says. Not the intellect, but God. Not the will, but God. Not the heart, but God. Not sight, but God. Not hearing, but God. Not smell, but God. Not taste, but God. Not breath, but God. Not touch, but God. Not air, but God, not food and drink, but God, not clothing, but God, not tranquility, but God, not, nor wo not worldly goods, but God, not riches, but God, not honor, but God, not recognition, but God, not dignity, dignities, but God, not promotions, but God, God is all and forever. You know what I was doing? I was doing that kind of well, that kind of a prayer. It's very similar to that. Okay, now what's that music? <laughs> Three hundred and thirty-two. Three hundred thirty-two. That's the stations of the cross. You know. And where did you find that music? Who wrote it? Kim, who wrote it? Hey, Kim, Kim, can you tell me what this says? I did it. Yeah, no, but can you tell me without reading? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Yeah. Yes. When you get a live breed, do you have to set a limit for him for the time span that he yes. spends in the library? He has to be out by five, between 5.15 and 5.19. What time do you go? Uh, uh, usually about a quarter to three, 2.30, quarter to three. Everybody in the library watches over him. I mean, uh, they, they know he's there. And whenever a TV group comes in to do something in the library, they always find him so they can get him into it, so they can tell him about what's new in the library. Yeah. He seems very tired. Is this hard for him? Well, we've, been, we've had a tiring time the last couple of days. Mm -hmm. He usually, uh, pretty, he sleeps probably five, five and a half to six hours a night. Gets by with that. But uh, we didn't sleep on the plane and we left Salt Lake. It, we got up before four o'clock yesterday morning and then we, we didn't get to bed till about 11.30 last night. Got up about uh, five o'clock this morning. And we've got two hour difference. We lost that too, so. Yeah. He's tired. <laughs> but he goes to sleep when I introduce him. He gets to sleep, yeah. Um, I want a little bit of help from Kim. I'm thinking about getting a new SUV, and I want to know if he's aware of which SUVs have gotten the number one ratings in the last few years. Can he help me? Do you know anything about SUVs? I don't see very many people who have, know a lot of people who have them. Yeah, he doesn't know too much about SUVs. Buy yourself a Ford 250 truck. <laughs> And get a camper on the back, because that's got f really a good rating. Maybe <laughs> read consumer reports or something? No, he doesn't read consumer reports, no. Basically, he looks like fact, he likes real factual stuff, mostly historical. Uh, I'm surprised that he spent a lot of time with the Bible and stuff, except he has so many friends that he, he wants to be able to talk to them too, you know. And it's amazing to hear him, uh, hear him talk. Uh, uh, when he was in the Jewish community of Miami last year, he, uh, uh, they told him he was talking to an Orthodox group of girls in the afternoon. And they, he says, what do I need to know about them? They said, you need to know that the first three rows are going to be under 10 years of age. If they ask you a question, you can go down and shake their hand and thank them. The last three rows are girls between 10 and 14. And if they ask you a question, you cannot go down and touch them. You can just answer their question from the stage. And so he gets in there and they introduce him and he says, you know, you young girls down there under 10, he says, you ask me some good questions and I can come down and shake your hand. And I want to do that. And he says, now you older girls, 10 to 14, he says, if you ask me a question, all I get to do is hug the rabbi. <laughs> Yes. Can he live the state capitals? Oh, sure. Kim, come here. I need you by the mic. You know what she asked you? One of these things you do in school sometimes. Now, you got to get near the mic, though, so they hear it. He's going to tell you the states with their capitals in the order they came onto the flag. Okay? Dover, Delaware, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Trenton, New Jersey, Atlanta, Georgia, Hartford, Connecticut, Boston, Massachusetts, Annapolis, Maryland, Columbia, South Carolina, Concord, New Hampshire, Richmond, Virginia, Albany, New York, Raleigh, North Carolina, Providence, Rhode Island, Montpelier, Vermont, Frankfort, Kentucky, Nashville, Tennessee, Columbus, Ohio, Indianapolis, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Indianapolis, Indiana, ja Jackson, Mississippi, Springfield, Illinois, Montgomery, Alabama, Augusta, Maine, Jefferson City, Missouri, Little Rock, Arkansas, Lansing, Michigan, Tallahassee, Florida, Austin, Texas, Des Moines, Iowa, Madison, Wisconsin, Sacramento, California, Sa Palm, Minnesota, Salem, Oregon, Topeka, Kansas, Charleston, West Virginia, Carson City, Nevada, Lincoln, Nebraska, Denver, Colorado, Bismarck, North Dakota, Pierce, South Dakota, Helena, Montana, Olympia, Washington, Boise, Idaho, Cheyenne, Wyoming, Salt Lake City, Utah, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Santa Fe, New Mexico, Phoenix, Arizona, Juneau, Alaska, Honolulu, Hawaii. Thank you. Thank you.
Kim, here's another question right here. Can you sing the um, fifth concerto from Beethoven? You know the. And when did he write that? In 1809. When was he around? 1770, 1827. You, you, you knew you recognized it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Music makes him extra excited, too. Yes. Yes. Who played for the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Pittsburgh Pirates the same year? Kim, the, who played for the Steelers and the Pirates the same year, do you know? I don't know. Do you know? <laughs> Are they in the same state? <laughs> Pittsburgh and Philadelphia in the same state. <laughs> Kim, come down here and tell us what you said because we can't hear you from way back there. What, what did they say and what did you answer? Uh, I can do everything I can do that I know. <laughs> yes, that's true. Yes, this lady over here. Yes, yell aloud to us. Uh -huh. None. <laughs> Never died. No. None. 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 Okay. None. Okay. Give me a Can you tell us the Bible verse, Isaiah 41.10? Isaiah 41.10. He, 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 he's talking about the... He's talking about the people, about the... that the people of Israel should work together. Thank you and be... And not tired. And who, who's who's talking? Isaiah says that the people in Israel should work together and not tire out when the and not tire out. Okay, is that right? Okay. Does Kim have to take any kind of medication? Uh, he does. He uh, three years ago he had congestive heart failure and we almost lost him. He's he's recovered from that, but he has to still take a, a heart medication and the blood pressure medication. And he has also, they thought he had type 2 diabetes because the rest of the family has it, but his the blood glucose stays in the 80s and low 90s, so he doesn't have it. We're kind of protecting from that. Yes, way back there. Yeah, well, he can't eat red meat and he can't drink uh, carbonated Cokes and stuff. Uh, he drinks fruit juices and he eats uh, fish and uh, uh, vegetables and chicken. Yes. Well, if pi, to tell him how how many three, numbers you go. One, three one four one six 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 and on and on and on. Yeah, <laughs> three point one four. You know, he, he he's not supposed to be able to do math. Uh, math. And he says he won't do math because he can't reason. We had a Japanese camera crew over here last. Uh, about uh, six months ago, 
And the last thing they did, they said, we want to see how he knows numbers. So they put five bingo cards in front of him and they said, can you know what these are? And he says, yeah, they're bingo cards. They, and they said, what do they mean to you? He says, means we got to get them to a senior citizen center so they can put, <laughs> they can put their raisins on it and win some candy bars. <laughs> And the, the woman, the interpreter, she says, well, Kim, that isn't what we meant. And he says, I know what you mean. The first one total is 981. And if you divide it by the 25 squares, you get a medium number of 36.7. And I said, Kim, you, you can't do that. And they said, do you mind if we check it with a calculator? And so they got one out of their camera bags. He was right. I says, I didn't know you could do that, Kim. And so she, they said, uh, can you do the other four cards and let us check them as you do them? Well, he did all four before they could get the second one checked. And then they went on and did it. And he says, now add up all your numbers. Do you have? And he gave them the total number and the median number of the five cards. And uh, I said, Kim, you, you just really amazed me. I didn't know you could do math. He says, where have you been, Dad? That wasn't math. That was simple arithmetic. <laughs> When Dustin Hoffman was interviewing him for the thing, he tested him on math. He says, what's, uh, what's six, six, four, two, zero times five, four, two, six, something like that. And Kim says, you double the top and half the bottom, double the top, half the bottom, double the top, half the bottom, double the top and half the bottom. He's now Dustin, you've only got one number on the bottom, you ought to be able to do that. And he says, I don't know what the top number is, Kim, I had no idea you were going to say that to me. So he gives him the top number and he says, get somebody to give you a piece of paper so you can sit down and figure it out. <laughs> so he can, he can do things like that. He just doesn't like to do. He can't do square roots and squares. Sometimes he does. I mean, somebody gives him a square or a number and a number and he'll square it. But he doesn't really like to do it. Mathematics, just arithmetic, long division. He used to when he was about uh, about 10 or 11 years old. He used to add up a column in the telephone book and then divide it by the top number so he could see what the, what the median of all the numbers would equal from the total, what the median telephone number is. And now in his journal, when he goes to the library, besides reading, he writes down a list of people with the same surname. Then he finds, he, he chooses a four number code that, I don't know how he figures it out, but if the people with the same last name in the telephone books he's looking up have the same last four numbers in their last four numbers, if it's 0134 it can be 3410, but if the last four numbers of their telephone have the same code numbers, then he writes down their name and their address and the phone numbers. And then when he's finished his list of, of surnames, and when he puts the telephone books back on the shelves in the library, he opens the yellow page in the front and memorizes the street map, which takes him about 45 seconds to a minute. And then he now knows what all the streets are in that city. If you have a city, he'd probably tell you most of your streets too, so. And tell you, man. And tell you, all you folks, that I've been really close to you folks. And I really like to be around people. And I do too. You do what? And I do too, and I really like to be around people. Yes, you like people. You've learned a lot about them, haven't you? Yes. I remember the first time I took him out, because I was really scared that I would have him on display. And I didn't want to do that, but I also wanted to give him more than 20 people in his life, and that's all he'd had all of his years. 37 years he knew 20, about 20 people. And, uh, so I said, and his brother, myself, and Kim voted with the sister and his mother. His sister and the mother didn't want him to go out. On the, uh, they said he'll embarrass the family and he'll embarrass himself. And I said, well, I promised Dustin I would try it, and I really don't know how to do it, and I don't want to make him different, too different in front of people. So I said, what I'm going to do, let me have one try. And so we voted, and it was the three men to the two women. So we said, we're going to try it. If it doesn't work, you, you, Mom and Allison, you help us figure out some way, other way. We can give him some kind of social experience. And they, they didn't like that. But anyway, uh, we, I decided to take him to a junior high school. I thought, if he can talk to 14 and 15-year-old kids, and they don't make him look like an idiot, uh, he may be able to educate some and I can maybe measure what will happen down the road a little bit. 
we took him to a school. The kids had had two weeks to prepare questions. They had 81 questions that they had come up with. Uh, they had some like 275 that they, they discussed and broke down to these 81 special hard questions. They had representatives from their, some of their classes come up with about five or six questions apiece, and they sat on the stage. They, they took turns asking Kim's question. He answered all 81 of them. And then we had about five minutes left, so I said, is there anybody in the audience who would like to ask him a question that hasn't been asked yet? And this one 14-year-old boy stood up, and he says, I have a question. He says, Kim, how does it feel to be a spastic? And Kim says, fine, what are you proud of? And the whole audience stood up and they clapped for about 30 seconds. After the assembly ended, the boy came up with two other boys. And he said, I, I want to apologize, Mr. Peek and Kim, that that was a dumb question. I, I shouldn't have asked it. And Kim says, you got what you wanted. You got attention. And he said, I don't want that kind of attention. He said, I brought my two friends because they dared me to ask it. That's why I asked it. And Kim took all three of them and put them in front of him. And he put his arms around them and squeezed them all towards the center. And then he stepped back and he says, now that you're educated, we can always be friends. And uh, <laughs> we, we, we seldom ever had anybody that, that gets upset because he's talking to people. And I know he walks around and, and he throws his hands funny and he looks different. And uh, uh, I remember when he went and talked to uh, uh, Alternative High School in Utah and we had about uh, 30 uh, gang members that are on parole sitting in the first three rows, and most of them had baseball caps on, and uh, uh, all kinds of stuff. They had parole officers and, and PT people at the end of each thing, uh, controlling them if they got out of hand. And Kim says, uh, I see a lot of you guys are uh, probably um, in a little bit of law trouble. He says, you need to know something. When you're in a school right now, a school is a place that you respect. And yourself is something you respect. And you've got to learn how to respect yourself. That's going to take a lot of work, but you can start by taking your hats off. And he says, if you don't want to take them off, I says, I, he says, that's okay. You can just leave the room. And I thought, God, what if somebody's got a knife and they'll throw it at him or something, you know? Well, about five or six of them left. The other kids stayed there, and he, he didn't talk to them because they were different and just as different as he was. He talked to the rest of the student body and answered their questions. It was very polite. And, and some of these kids down here asked questions. One of them says, uh, when, was, uh, when was Hitler alive? We get a lot of questions from the gang kids about Hitler and other kinds of morbid things. And Kim says that he never was alive. I guess, what do you mean he wasn't alive, ever alive? He's, he was never alive. In, in the uh, eyes of God, he wasn't here. He says he did a, maybe a lot of bad things, but he says he sh if he was alive, he shouldn't have been here. And if you're thinking about him, you shouldn't think about him because they're bad things. Anyway, after it was over, the, the, uh, one of the parole officers came up and he says, these kids would like to know if they could walk by on the way out and shake your hands. And a lot of them do that now in detention centers. They all walk by and they shake his hand. Uh, I don't know what impact he makes on them, but it must help a little bit because the, the justices that often come to his presentations, the kids that are in trouble, will say that. He says, an hour with Kim is worth 20 hours with our social workers. They, they listen to him and they'll change. And when he says to him, you know, he says, if you only loved your mom and dad half as much as they love you, you'd be halfway home. And uh, one day in a detention center in Cedar City, Utah, he, we left after talking to about 15 kids. He says, Dad, I have to go back. And I says, why? And he says, I forgot something. And I said, what'd you forget? And the highway patrol says, we'll let him back through. We went through the gates and back into the room, and these kids are all standing up because they'd shaken hands with him. And he walked over and he took the right hand of one kid and the left hand of the other. And, and what did you think? I wish you bluebirds in the spring. For all your heart, a song to sing, and for a kiss, and more than this, I wish you love. And he walked over to the next two. He sang that to all of the kids standing around there, and the highway patrol wear dark brown tops on their, their shirts, and they were just soaked with tears. It was just so touching. 
and we went out of the gates again and I put my arm around Kim I says Kim that was so nice I says that was so thoughtful of you he says it wasn't that good dad and I said what do you mean and what did you say John Gary sings that much. John Gary sings that a lot better than I do <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and when we went down to see and when we went down to see this guy on to see these people with our friends and there was a time that we were going to... Where did we go? We were with Galtooth, and we wanted to... And... and, and Where no, did we go? We, we, uh, remember that time when we were coming back to see Terry and Claire? And Claire, Claire, we'd seen them for the day, and they were going to come back with us. We drove up this one little... Yeah, this one little... This one that we drove up this one street near the beach, and... And she was looking for this lady, and, he, and she wasn't home. Goldtooth was looking for a friend. She had her address, but uh, nobody was home, right? Okay, and yeah. so what happened? She wanted to look uh, at it some more. Is that all it was? Yes. But we never did find her. We never did, we never did find her. We used to take Mary Ruth with the gold tooth and my sister Phyllis on a lot of our trips that we would drive our car with because we thought they needed a break from being 80 and 70 years old and, uh, and they enjoyed talking to each other so they, we'd go to Las Vegas and they'd get a room and we'd get a room and we'd have breakfast and dinner together and talk and uh, get out and stop the car and have little picnics on the roads, huh? We had a good time with him, and now my, my sister passed away in 1997, Mary Ruth's in the Alzheimer ward and doesn't recognize us, but, well, she recognizes us with her eyes and her smile, but she doesn't know our names, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. He got another question over here. Kim, I'd like to know if you have any pets. Do you like pets, or do you read any stories about animals? No. Huh? We haven't had a pet for almost 20 years. We can't have pets. We live in a condo area. If you want a dog, it costs you $1,000 a month, and if, if you don't pick up after it, it costs you $500 every time you don't. <laughs> And then we wouldn't, we were gone three weeks out of a month, so we'd have to put in a kennel all the time. So we don't have any pets. He had a cat when we first moved back to uh, Three Fountains, where we live in 1981. My wife and I were divorced in 1981, and, and uh, uh, she remarried about three months later, two months later. Yeah. Anyway, she, she uh, was, met a guy that she'd grown up with since age six, and uh, she uh, kind of, applied for a job after she got her PhD in educational administration. She applied for a principalship in a high school and they told her she could be a principal in a junior high but because she was female she could be a high school principal so she tore up her papers and everything else and she got so down, depressed. I, for two years I sent her to a psychiatrist twice a week and all that time she'd met this guy. <laughs> oh anyway, um, we were married for 32 years, so that, and then I became a single parent from about 1979 on with Kim, and, and uh, I haven't had time to think about getting married. I said to Mary Ruth, who now has Alzheimer's, I said, you know what I've been thinking of doing? She says, what that? I says, I'm going to have a sex change and take you to San Francisco. <laughs> we can get married. Huh? Yeah. yeah, Kim, here's a, que here's a question. I was born on May 30th, 77. What can you tell me about that date? It was the, it was the first memorial that I held on that day in seven years. And, 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 it, and this year it's, uh, it is Sunday and you retire in 2042 on a Friday. Thank you. You know, you know, it was interesting. We were talking in an LDS ward one night, and this fellow calls Kim over, and he says, uh, I was born on uh, January the 13th, 1931. Kim, she was born on a Friday the 13th. He says, that's right. And I said to Kim, when else was his birthday? He's on Friday the 13th. So he told him all the years that his birthday was on Friday the 13th, and he said, now the next one won't be till 2007. And he says, you know, Kim, he says, my wife here tells me that the reason I've been so unlucky all my life is because I was born on Friday the 13th. He says, if you got it 
wrong, sir. Your wife's the one who's been unlucky. <laughs> Yes. April. Thank you. April 13th, 1976. It's a Tuesday, and this year it's a Tuesday, and you retire in 2041 on a Saturday. Thank you. When she was 16, what was the best picture? It was. It was. It was Unforgiven, Clint Eastwood. What was the best music? Don't know what it was. Who won the World Series that week? It was when Philadelphia beat Atlanta, uh, Toronto beat Atlanta, thank you. Toronto beat Atlanta? Yes, thank you. Now what about the Super Bowl when she was 20? It was, y y you know, I think it was in San Francisco beat San Diego, thank you. When she was 15, what was the Super Bowl? It was uh, when the Giants beat the Bills by only one point. And uh, who were the quarterbacks? There was Phil Sims against Jim Kelly, thank you. Okay. Way over there. September 26, 1980. September 26, 1980. It's a Friday, and this year it's a Sunday. You retire in 2045 on a Tuesday, and you're welcome here. <laughs> what happened? What was happening in the world the week she was born? The Iran Iraq Iran attacked Iraq, and uh, and uh, the first the first installment of Sunday morning and this morning premiered. What was that? Is that a TV show? Yes, the bo they both did. What networks? CBS. CBS. Okay. Uh, it was um, back in 1991. He went up to talk to a junior high school near Hillfield in Utah, and many of the of the students were wearing yellow ribbons on their clothing. And he says, uh, I want to thank you for letting us borrow your moms and dads and brothers and sisters from the 32nd Medical Reserve that's in your city. They're all in Saudi Arabia helping our soldiers during the Persian Gulf War. And the little 14-year-old high school president came over and put her arm around his shoulder and she said, that was so sweet of you, Kim, because people don't know how much these kids miss their families and they come to school every day. And she says, Kim, what's your opinion of the Persian Gulf War? And what did you say? Saddam shame. Saddam shame. <laughs> About three weeks later, I talked to the principal and I said, uh, uh, how's school going? And she says, we've never had a phrase that's been more used in our school in my life. She says, every time a kid's late for school, it's a damn shame. And every time he loses a paper, it's a damn shame. <laughs> Well, we're getting ready. A lot of people are starting to leave. I don't know what time we should stop, but oh, it's getting pretty close. It's uh, eight. It's uh, nine o'clock. My clock's still Salt Lake City time. <clears throat> he keeps. He moves it around. Listen, Kim, come and tell him your message one more time, will you, please? Right here. Recognize and respect differences. Learning to recognize and respect differences in others. Treat them as much as they want them to treat you, so we can have a better world to live in. We want to thank you very much for coming. Thank you.